A lot of our suffering and stress comes from the limitations we feel in our lives. We've got this body that needs constant care. And even though we care for it, what does it do? It starts getting old. It gets ill. It finally dies, no matter how well we care for it. And it doesn't ask permission before it does any of these things. It doesn't give any warning. And the financial, financial limitations, social limitations. You look around, it seems like we're getting hemmed in all the time. I had a dream one time in which I died in the dream. And the experience of death was like the world just closing in, closing in, closing in until you had no room to stay anywhere and you had to get out. And that's the way life is. It just keeps closing in, closing in all these limitations that come from outside. But it's not, not just the outside limitations, the really constraining limitations are the ones in our own minds. And these are the ones that we create for ourselves. The good news here, though, is that we can learn not to create them. We can learn to take down these barriers. In fact, the whole practice is one of taking down barriers, taking down limitations. Even from the very beginning, the very basic levels, generosity, being willing to give of yourself, give of your time, give of your energy. So often generosity gets tied up into fundraising. We think that it's mainly an issue of giving money. But it's more giving of yourself. And as you give of yourself, you find that you get a lot in return. You build, as the John Lee would say, a typical Thai idiom is that you build goodness within yourself. And that's something that's like yeast. It begins to expand, cuts down barriers. The giving of a gift is the overcoming of a barrier. both between people and, but more importantly, a barrier in your own mind, your selfishness, your tendency to say, I can give only this much and the rest I want to get. The Thais have a phrase for the quality that comes with generosity, literally be translated as heart water or heart juice, nam chai. That's what it does. It moistens the heart that's been dry. And it starts to grow. The same with the precepts. You're overcoming barriers, again, in your attitudes towards what you can do, how scrupulous you can be about your behavior. This last weekend we were talking about the precepts and getting down to a lot of the nitty-gritty about how you deal with ants in your house. And there's one person in the group who, every time this issue comes up, complains that it's getting too picky -uni. But the whole purpose of the precepts is to join up Learn to be more and more scrupulous in how you act, how you speak, how you think. Treat it as a skill, as with any skill. Say you're making furniture. You want a fine finish on the furniture. You want a snug fit between the pieces of wood. And that comes from being scrupulous, very precise. And as you learn to take the same attitude towards your life, again, it's an attitude of putting more energy into what you're doing so that you do it really well. In such a way that it's not harming anyone at all. Again, the lesson here is what you put in, what you give. And so doing, you find yourself creating fewer and fewer barriers for yourself. When you break the precepts, you're placing barriers on your life. So you t tell a lie. All of a sudden that lie becomes something you have to carry around with you. You have to remember who you told the lie to and what the lie was. And the results of that lie come to to haunt you, to come to place barriers on you. Whereas with that precept and with all the precepts, as you follow them, you find you're placing fewer and fewer barriers on yourself. The world opens up. It's a much more secure place. Because you've been giving security to other people, you have a share in that as well. And then as we meditate, the first thing you run into are the hindrances, literally call that hindrances, obstacles. Again, they're self-created. 
sensual desire the Buddha compares to debt. Ill will he, he compares to a sickness or an illness. Sloth and torpor he compares to a prison. Restlessness and anxiety he compares to slavery. Uncertainty he compares to traveling across barren landscape, dangerous landscape. These are all things that we create in our minds. So it's good to have antidotes for them, to come overcome them. One of the series of antidotes is what they call the Ten Recollections. Sometimes they're listed as six, sometimes they're listed as ten. But they're helpful to give that expansive sense of heart that can help overcome the limitations we tend to, tend to place on ourselves. Because what the limitations basically are comes down to we want to get pleasure and then it's thwarted. So either we respond with anger or we respond with boredom or we respond with restlessness and anxiety or we respond with uncertainty. So we've got to look at that getting attitude, remind ourselves of the giving attitude that's been nourishing our hearts all along. This is why one of the, reflect, one of the recollections is recollection on your own generosity, recollection on your own virtue, times when you gave of yourself. That helps to nourish the mind. When the mind is well nourished, it, it's not interested in picking up those obstacles and making them into bigger obstacles than they have to be. When you remind yourself of the happiness that comes from giving, the, the interest in gaining sensual pleasures or in feeding on sensual pleasures helps to gets less and less. And when that's less, then you find yourself less irritable, less bored, less restless, less uncertain. So this is one of the many techniques that there are for dealing with the hindrances. There are others as well. Specifically with sensual desire, you can start thinking about well, what exactly is it that you're desiring so much? And then really look, take a good careful look at the object of your desire, especially if it's sexual desire. Look first at your own body. What's it made out of? What have you got there? Of any real worth, of any real it's really all that attractive. Take all the pieces apart and what is there? There's nothing much. In fact, you start getting into the inner pieces of the inner parts. It's positively repulsive. And yet we so find it so easy to turn a blind eye to that. And yet when you look with open eyes, you realize that the object itself is not all that attractive. And, but then the problem is not so much the object, it's the mind's willingness to close its eyes, make believe. And John Swat once made an interesting comment. There's, there's the word sanya, which we usually translate as perception or a mental label. But in Thai it also means an agreement, a contract. And when you look at your mind, you find the mind is actually making an agreement to turn a blind eye to things, to put up barriers so it can't see the full story, so it can focus only on what it wants to focus on, whether it wants to focus on attractive things or wants to start focusing on unattractive things as a basis for anger. There's that willingness to play a game with itself. This is one of the mind's biggest limitations. It's because of this game playing that we can get wound up in sensual desires, that we can get wound up in irritation, ill will, restlessness, and anxiety. There's even a part of the mind that's willing to go along with sloth and torpor and uncertainty. It's this willingness to agree to these things. The Buddha says the hindrances are fed by inappropriate attention, which means that when they come along, we're willing to play along with them. That's what we've got to deal with. Look at the state of mind that wants to get involved in sensual desire, that wants to feed on anger, find satisfaction in anger and ill will, that's happy to see sloth and torpor come along. Oh, here we are. It's not working. Better give up. Try to see the part of the mind that's playing along there, the part that feels that something really useful is being done when it's restless and anxious. The part that likes to be thwarted with uncertainty. It's, it's, it sounds strange, but there is a part of human psychology that 
takes satisfaction in these hindrances. Which is why the hindrances are not just there. We're playing along with them, we're feeding them, we're creating them, we're throwing up barriers in our own way. Because we feel comfortable within those barriers, at least we think we do. They're familiar. And the idea of taking them down seems a little bit threatening. More will be demanded of us. But it's when you stop and take a really good look at what you've got here. You've got limitations on the mind. They squeeze the mind. To try to learn to think in more expansive ways. This is why we start out every evening with a chant on goodwill. Goodwill for ourselves, goodwill for other beings, without limitation. Compassion for other beings. Appreciation or sympathetic joy for other beings, all living beings. Equanimity. Try to keep these thoughts as unlimited as possible. Let them stretch your mind. And then try to live within those attitudes. They're called Brahma-viharas. Vihara means a dwelling. It's not just something that you visit for a few minutes and then forget about. And John Munn would practice these three times a day, when every day when he would wake up. Spread thoughts of goodwill to all beings. After his midday nap, goodwill for all beings. Before he went to sleep at night, goodwill for all beings. And it formed the background of his meditation. To try to develop this more unlimited attitude, it comes through being generous. It comes through being virtuous as a background for the meditation, as a foundation for the meditation, because it teaches us that true happiness comes from overcoming these barriers through giving ourselves, giving of ourselves. And when you come to the meditation with that attitude of giving, you find the meditation is a much more expansive place to be, a much more expansive process. So we can work on the more refined barriers we have in the mind. This I-making and my-making the places of limitation on ourselves as well. All the various forms of clinging. Everything we cling to becomes a barrier, becomes a limitation. As the Buddha said, that's how we define ourselves, by what we cling to, and that becomes our limitation. That becomes the extent. That becomes our measure, our limitation, he says. It's learning how to let go of those very subtle levels of clinging that the limitations are dropped, and then nobody can define us at all. We can't define ourselves. Nobody else can define us. As the texts say, you can't even be traced. The path you follow can't be traced either. Nobody can track you down. Total freedom. That's the direction we're heading. But the paradox here is that total freedom comes not from trying to get total freedom, but by giving of yourself. Because what is yourself? It's a lot of limitations. And by letting go of these limitations, you let go of barriers. That's one of the aspects of the cessation of suffering, the cessation of stress. Because it's not just a mental exercise, it's, a, it's an exercise of the heart as well. In fact, the limitations we place on the heart are probably a lot more, feel a lot more confining than the ones we place on our minds, if you want to make the distinction between the two. But it comes down that what it comes down to is it's there are limitations on both that we have to overcome. That's why the practice is a whole practice, not just a technique, but a whole practice of overcoming those barriers on this heart mind to the point where they can no longer be defined.